have uh, uh, a basic port upstreamed uh, with UART, uh, GPIO, device drivers, uh, clock, and uh, the next step is to get the connectivity aspect of this device working with Zephyr. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the, uh, this, this TI Simple Link. Uh, uh, in this case, it's the CC3200, uh, CC32XX family of MCUs, uh, SOC that has uh, two cores, and one of the cores is, uh, is the host MCU, which handles all of the typical uh, sensor data gathering, has, has many peripherals for uh, um, I2C, uh, uh, has ADC channels, um, UART, uh, SPY, um, and uh, power management capability. Uh, there's a host processor, and then there's a coprocessor that does all of the all of the connectivity, which is in this case Wi-Fi. So that coprocessor is also uh, well. The, the main processor is a Cortex M4. Uh, coprocessor is also a Cortex. Well, it's Cortex M3, I believe. Um, that offloads the Wi-Fi stack, and that's all of the. Uh, if you look at the OSA OS OSI model, it's uh, transport layer. Uh, and down, plus some other uh, stuff in addition to that. Uh, that's why the plus is there. Um, so the goal of this of this chip is to, and this is uh, geared for uh, IoT type devices, client devices. The goal is to basically take all of the complexity of the networking stuff and and all the resources and offload that from the host processor. So people just have to worry about. Um, their main application, and then they can call uh, some control APIs to set up the Wi-Fi um, do provisioning, and then call some BSD socket APIs to do the do the data communication. So the the great thing about this is that this uh, offloads all the need, uh, all the memory buffers, the network buffers are all offloaded and handled on the coprocessor. So the resources for memory, um, <coughs> CPU uh, time. Is, is all done on the, all offloaded onto the coprocessor. So what that means is that you could, for example, do some, uh, do some socket operations and uh, TCP sessions can be uh, still alive on the network coprocessor while the MCU goes into deep sleep. So, uh, so that's one of the things that TI's really big on is, is power management. So there's hibernate modes, sleep modes, deep sleep modes uh, that's all handled by this chip. So the current Simple Link SDK, uh, the SDK that comes with this, with this chip, supports out of the box uh, the TI uh, RTOS for the, for, the ma for the main host MCU and free RTOS. Currently doesn't, uh, uh, the SDK doesn't support Zephyr, but the, the TI Simple Link stack, the networking stack, which is a host driver and, uh, and other protocols, is meant to be portable to other operating systems. So this could be ported to Zephyr with, a, with an OS adaptation layer. Um, and that's, that's been done. So uh, Zephyr itself has a new IP stack. Uh, there was previously a Contiki type stack, and uh, there was a decision to go to a, a, a new native IP stack for various reasons, um, and that's currently under development. And uh, there was some uh, desire to have uh, uh, an offload option, so there's an experimental offload option in, in Zephyr, which uh, we've been looking at as a way to hook into the, uh, the SimpleLink Wi-Fi stack. Um, uh, so when we started looking at this, uh, when I started looking at this, uh, one of the things I naturally thought of was, well, what's what's been done in the past. Uh, so I looked into Linux and to see what past attempts there were to integrate these kinds of TCP IP offload engines into Linux and see what kind of challenges were, were met. So I'll review some of those challenges and then look at um, how this could work, this kind of offload could work in Zephyr with the current IP stack. So feel free to ask any questions as I go or, or jump in. Um, 
So some of these some of these challenges uh, are related more to Linux because it's more of a well more of a desktop kind of kind of issues than something that's relevant to uh, uh, smaller IoT devices. But some of these things, some of the points um, might be more relevant. Um, so even if you go to the uh, Linux Foundation website, there's a there's a page on TOE, uh, TCP IP offload engines, and they get, list all the reasons why Linux engineers don't believe that uh, TCP IP offload has any merit uh, for Linux. Um, now, uh, some of the some of the uh, items that they listed were, and in fact, some of the there, there were some uh, attempts to integrate uh, TCP IP offload into Linux uh, in the past, and a lot of those were uh, patches were not accepted um, for various reasons, including uh, problems with uh, uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the. Uh, uh, naturally, security is handled on the offload device, so it's done in firmware. So if some issues come up, then the Linux engineers, the maintainers, can't respond to it by making uh, updates quickly in the source code. Of course, you have to wait for the vendor to, to make a patch, which will vary depending on the vendor to, in terms of time. Um, also, every vendor does things differently, so it could be, it turned out to be complex to uh, to handle all of the different vendors' um, networking stacks, and things wouldn't quite work, didn't quite work, work out quite well uh, for things like QoS and packet filtering. Uh, maybe multiple bearer support didn't work well. Um, uh, things are proprietary, pretty much, uh, because each hardware vendor has uh, their own way of doing things, and it's, it's again in firmware. So can't be easily modified, closed source typically, and there's vendor specific tools. So for for example, to configure the uh, the offload engine NIC, um, there's there's often different tools uh, for, from the different vendors. Um, so you can follow those links and look at some of the other uh, the other reasons um, involving uh, security and uh, other things which I don't think are quite as relevant to to uh, to Zephyr, um, but then we'll. So, what I was mainly concerned about is how complex this would be to integrate into the into the IP stack. Uh, I'll just jump ahead and say it's turning out not to be as complex as the case of Linux. Um, the the Zephyr IP stack is a little smaller, fewer layers. Um, of course, it's brand new. <laughs> So it's a little simpler um, currently, but it's going to grow. Um, and this offload uh, tap, which appears to be architected into Zephyr, looks like it's something that could be a viable uh, way to offload the Wi-Fi. Um, anyways, so this is this is a picture of the TI SimpleLink architecture. Um, so as I said, it's an SOC. Uh, with uh, the the host MCU, uh, in this case, it's running um, the the Wi-Fi stack, which is just some APIs, pretty thin APIs for uh, wireless LAN connectivity setup, socket BSD sockets, and uh, some NetApp APIs, network configuration APIs. There's an OS abstraction layer to the OS. Um, you can put Zephyr in here now, pretty much, um, and and then there's device drivers. This is the TI SimpleLink SDK, not Zephyr right now. So, um, and on the networking engine, uh, it's running a proprietary OS, and it has uh, it's handling all of the uh, all the all the Wi-Fi stuff. TCP/IP um, handles uh, DHCP, DNS. It even has a, a built-in HTTP server. Um, there's a serial flash so that you can Add uh, certificates and um, profiles for automatic configuration and connection uh, during wireless LAN connect. Um, so there's there's a ton of capability on this on this platform. Um, 
So those are some of the APIs I just mentioned, six, six different sets. Uh, I'm mainly concerned with the BSD socket API and uh, some of the connection APIs right now. So with just this, with, with this architecture, as I mentioned, uh, we've already uh, taken this abstraction layer and ported it to uh, Zephyr. Um, and uh, there were some uh, interesting uh, things to do here because uh, this was assuming that the RTOS can handle dynamic creation of objects, uh, which Zephyr doesn't really do. So um, Zephyr is very static. So tasks, uh, semaphores, et cetera, everything like this uh, has to be uh, defined up front pretty much. Interrupts are plugged uh, at, at build time. Well, you, you do an IRQ connect and uh, it's not uh, dynamic. Uh, although there's some change to Zephyr to add that capability. Uh, but at the time I did this, it wasn't dynamic. So I had to create some pools of uh, static objects and, and dole them out. Anyways, so this, this was done at the last, uh, uh, at the last uh, Las Vegas uh, Connect. Uh, I was able to demo MQTT, TI's MQTT protocol stack over, over simple link running on Zephyr, showing uh, subscribe, publish of uh, LED toggling commands. And, uh, and this all worked fine. Um, but of course, this, this was implemented as TI's MQT, MQTT client stack running over TI socket APIs, uh, which are BSD socket type APIs, over the simple link host driver, which I showed previously. And this is bypassing the, the Zephyr native IP stack completely. Uh, what we'd really like to do is be able to reuse the, use the Zephyr networking apps that are written to the Zephyr uh, APIs as they currently are, or maybe this is gonna change. Um, and, and basically uh, get more value out of uh, using some of the Zephyr uh, protocols and uh, higher level protocols and uh, applications that are, that are being developed. So just a quick, um, over, quick uh, overview. This slide I've taken from the Zephyr, uh, Zephyr project presentation on the, on the IP stack. Uh, this is the architecture in a nutshell. Uh, applications talk to uh, what's not shown here. They talk to uh, an API called NetContext, which is socket-like, um, sort of BSD socket-like. Um, and these, uh, this net context uh, API then calls down into uh, uh, the core, uh, which handles uh, multiplexing to the right uh, network interface. So right now, we, Wi-Fi isn't there. Um, but for example, if you have an Ethernet driver, uh, it'll call the L2 uh, interface for the Ethernet driver, assuming that's the, the one that you're using. Right now, the decision to use which of these is, is pretty much just getting the default, uh, the default interface and then using that. So um, it's not able to use multiple at the same time as far as I understand. Uh, it looks like it's just going right down to whatever you've configured as your default network interface. So it goes to the, from the net context to an L2 interface to do send and then receive comes back to uh, some, uh, a receive fiber that, that calls back into the application through the net context interface. Um, so this, uh, this IP stack for Zephyr handles IPv, IPv6 and 4. Uh, one of the distinguishing features of it is that uh, uh, it has uh, network buffers, which are uh, a chain of fragments. So the, the, the goal is to uh, have efficient memory usage, which may not be the case with some of the other third party uh, IP stacks that were looked at as candidates for Zephyr. Um, <clears throat> the, the network buffers are set up ahead of time statically in pools. Uh, so you have a fixed number of buffers for receive and transmit. Um, and they're managed by the, uh, by the IP stack, the kernel. 
So, app, so unlike uh, traditional well, APIs, uh, applications that use the BSD socket APIs, where you allocate a buffer and then send it to the so down to the socket through uh, a send API, here you get a you get a transmit buffer from from Zephyr, and then you fill up parts of it with your data, um, and it could be multiple fragments, um, and then you send it off. Um, the other difference between the net context layer, which is up here, APIs and sockets are, um, most of these uh, Zephyr APIs are asynchronous, so when you do a send, you register a callback, you get called back when the send completes, and for receive, you set up the receive callback, and then when, when something comes in, the callback gets called, and then you, then you deal with it. Typically, you do another send as a reply, or you, you signal a semaphore, on a task that's waiting to do something. So it's a little bit more, I would say it's a little bit more complex to write an application using this API. Um, but the, the, the counter argument is it's more efficient. Um, well, we'll see. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the stack. Um, so there's this, as I mentioned, an, a new, uh, it's, called, it's market experimental, it's an offload, IP offload option. Uh, when I asked the designers what, what it's doing there and uh, what is, if there was a use case for it, they said, well, your, yours is the use case. Um, and, uh, you know, give it a shot. <laughs> so uh, looking at it, uh, uh, looking at the code, and uh, it basically implements this picture on the right. Um, it's right under the net context APIs, which was right at the top. So the applications call into this, this API, which is again, like, kind of like a socket a, a API. And if you have uh, in your kconfig, config net L2 offload, now it's called L2 offload, but in reality, uh, it's really working, I think, more like uh, transport offload or at the TCP IP level or L4 offload. Although there is some connection with L2. So, probably. Um, so, but um, you need to create an L2 driver still to kind of get this started currently. I mean, this, again, this experimental, so I think, uh, you know, we'll need to discuss uh, uh, with the, with the uh, network uh, guys and say, you know, maybe it makes more sense to have this at a different level. Uh, if this is all going to work out in the first place. And we don't really need uh, to start from the L2 side. Um, so far, um, L2, L2 is giving some information, though, uh, that's useful. Uh, there's a reserve, uh, which returns the number of bytes to reserve for, for headers. So in my case, it's, it's zero. So that has to come from someplace. And there's an enable, which I'm currently using to hook into to, uh, to get this thing plumbed in. But it could be done differently. I think it should be done differently. But anyways, like, like I said, I'm just trying to get this to work and see where the gaps are. So, <clears throat> so this implements a sort of a tap to a parallel stack. So this would be when, you're, when you've configured, configured uh, offload, um, it sees that when you make these API calls, it vectors off to, to another set of functions. And, and they call into the vendor's IP stack, TCP IP stack. And it's there where we're calling the simple link stack to do the connects and the get put and uh, these, these APIs. Bind, listen, connect, send, send to receive. Um, so on the send, it's simply calling, uh, calling the simple link uh, uh, socket send APIs. On the receive, uh, there's a server that's listening with a select call that's uh, listening to sockets. And then uh, when it unblocks, then uh, basically handle the, uh, handle the connection and make a callback that was registered from a previous call through NetContext API. So I'm keeping track of the callbacks. Uh, so for example, when you want to receive NetContext, NetContext receive, sends in a callback 
for the socket or connection handle, scroll that away, and then when, when something comes in on that socket, make that call back, fire that call back. So in theory, this seems to be working. Uh, when I say in theory, in actuality. So if I'm running Echo Client. Echo Client is one of the Zephyr uh, applications. Uh, so I can send UDP sockets and I can receive uh, UD UDP. Did I say UDP? UDP sockets, uh, UDP uh, packets, datagrams. Uh, so that's working. Um, so as I said, that there are the differences between net context and, and, and socket APIs. Um, asynchronous versus synchronous, stack allocates, manages buffers. Um, one of the big things is applications. Every application has to kind of deal with these network buffers. So uh, if you get a buffer, you have to see how many fragments there are in this chain of buffers, a uh, chain of fragments, and you have to walk through that chain. So pretty much every application and even some drivers are, are doing that one way or the other, going from network buffers to, the, to a linear buffer or linear to, to network buffers. And um, if everyone dealt with the same buffers, it wouldn't be a problem, I guess, if you didn't have to go between linear and continuous and, and fragments. Um, and of course, there's, there's helper functions to go through the fragments. Um, but it just adds a little bit more complexity, in my opinion, to every application. Um, um, that you wouldn't have with the socket APIs. Of course, with the socket APIs, you wouldn't have as much memory efficiency uh, because ap applications would be allocating buffers all over the place. Um, so there's a trade-off. Um, the other thing is, uh, it's not exactly true, but it, the, the buffer is not an opaque object, so an application can look into the buffer, you can get this connection handle, network interface, you can call into the L2 driver, and you can do a lot of stuff at that point. So it's not completely abstracted uh, uh, to, the, to the application. Um, so so that, that's, that's the way the uh, architecture looks with the offload. So there's actually, so the options, so going back, So, um, so I'm implementing this uh, by using this offload option. The other, the other thing is, um, could write an L2 driver directly um, that uh, that just cuts off at at the at the lower la the lower layer. Um, uh, Coprocessor. Uh, there's some. There's a command interface. By the way, I didn't get into the details, but. Uh, the, the interface between the MCU and the and the network coprocessor is is a spy. It's hardware registers and spy, uh, and so um, every command like SL, like a simple link uh, send command, uh, wireless LAN connect, goes uh, puts a command message together and sends it over to the uh, to the coprocessor and then it, it responds with uh, with the data and and, and uh, error code. Uh, there's a mode where you can work with raw sockets where you can basically, we could implement uh, uh, an L2 driver uh, to just do uh, raw sockets. But the, the whole goal of the Simple Link uh, coprocessor is that you, you offload TCP and uh, session management and uh, you can even offload DHCP, DNS, um, as I said, even HTTP server, you can offload all this and put the MCU to sleep. So it's true that we could go down to this level and implement an L2 uh, driver, and then if you did that, you'd have more uh, flexibility. For example, the, the core IP stack could then, uh, let's say if it can deal with all these guys, it could route packets uh, if it needed to uh, between devices, it could, uh, Maybe do more uh, packet. You can do packet filtering, uh, statistics on its own. Uh, the the TI part that has its own filtering and statistics capabilities, but then that would be offloaded also from Zephyr, and you'd have to figure out how to make, get the two to work. So there's, there, there would be some advantages to doing that, but 
then on the other hand, we wouldn't get the hardware, TI wouldn't get the hardware entitlement that, that we're really putting out there with this device. So, so those are basically the two options. And I'm going down option number one first. Um, and it seems to, seems to be working so, so, uh, so far, um, at least with UDP. Um, so there's, there's pros and cons of these two options. And uh, the reason I think this is the best option is because, uh, again, it's, it's giving the hard, hardware entitlement uh, in terms of code, memory, and energy savings. And uh, as I said, the APIs, the net context APIs are BSD-like, uh, socket-like, socket -like, so the mapping is, is possible. Um, um, and, as, and, and doing this exercise is going to highlight some of the areas where, like I mentioned, where some of the abstractions can be improved. Um, and, uh, but mapping, doing this mapping adds some inefficiency. The net buff chain is going to linear buffers, which is what uh, Simple Link expects, and going back the other way. Uh, right now, I'm circumventing that by just having the uh, the MTU size, the transmit unit size, be the buffer size that's configured in Zephyr. So, I get one packet from receive, and I stick that in one network buffer fragment. So I don't have to go through all the network buffer fragments. That's kind of a quick and easy way to avoid that for now, but. Uh, it's working with UDP. Um, so the, the maximum size that SimpleLink can take on receive. So it's 1472 uh, bytes. So it can't accept any more than that on one, one datagram. Um, so as I said, the pros of writing an L2 driver, you hook more deeply into the Zephyr IP core. Um, so you can do other things. These other things like packet routing across network interfaces is not something I don't think typically a TI customers who are doing IoT clients are gonna care about, getting packet from Wi-Fi and sending it over Bluetooth. Or, so it didn't seem like a high priority. Um, it, as far as we know, it's not for our customers. Uh, and we really want the full hardware entitlement by having everything offloaded. Uh, currently, for example, uh, DHCP is, uh, is offloaded uh, in, in my implementation, um, which is a problem because uh, Zephyr doesn't allow that to be offloaded right now. Uh, so I'd have to either pull that back and just use the Zephyr DHCP, uh, but it's possible to take DHCP, DNS, and some of these other things and offload them as well. Um, so the, some of the other things I didn't uh, really have time to go into uh, but need to be thought about is uh, some of the management APIs. So as I said, SimpleLink has some APIs for connecting to the wireless LAN, connecting to the access point to configure whether you're uh, station and access point, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mode to configure APIs, MAC address, static IP address, things like that. Where does that go? So uh, unlike uh, POSIX uh, sockets where you have some standard, I don't believe there's many standards here I, in looking, but um, uh, that's something that needs to be, need to be done in a standard way. Uh, and sockets, uh, secure connections. So uh, TI has a very, uh, I'd say, elegant way of setting up uh, um, SSL and TLS sockets. Uh, so you basically, you just use, uh, you use uh, socket option commands and you set up the, the attributes of the type of security you want, type of SSL, type of TLS, uh, that you want, a pointer to the, f the uh, certificate file that's on Flash, and you do that all with uh, socket options, and then you just do your send and receive, your, your connect, send and receive, and everything the way you normally would. Uh, if you look at the current implementation with embed TLS, 
There's, uh, you look at the library that's involved and there's, it's, it's different. There's a lot of wrappers, or its own, its own socket library. Um, and uh, if, you, if you just want to do echo client and make that secure, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it would be very easy to do with the TI simple link solution. But with embed, embed TLS, it's a little more complex. So how would we reconcile those models? We have this to offer as a way to do it. Um, should that be a way to do it that's different? Um, that's, that's another uh, question for discussion. So I don't know what my time is here. Okay, five o'clock. I think it went over. All right. Uh, so any questions or uh, you can come to the Zephyr Mini Summit and uh, this is one of the topics, networking and offload and buffer management and all this. So maybe I'll learn something actually since I'm pretty new to the networking stuff. All right, thank you.